Jim Gazier. Thank you, Jim. This is the first actual week of the community groups, and as Jeff said, if you haven't gotten into a group, I would really encourage you to. And the reason is because this is the most really sort of formative study that we do. There was a point in which I tried to teach a small group through what we'll be going through this time um, every year, but we've never done it in worship. We've never really tried to attempt it in this format. So if you can, if you even can make half of the weeks, we'd love for you to be a part. And you'll notice that Wednesday night group that is actually on site here at Granada has space in it. You can come here and have dinner and be here for that group that meets. Uh, we pick up today in the book of Galatians in the New Testament. And as, as always, it's in your program. It's on the wall behind me. And you'll see, I think you'll see why this is the first step we take on this journey today. Please follow along. It's the Apostle Paul, the Word of God. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is not a lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we gather today, that you give us a new vision to see you at work in the world, in our own lives. Lord, we really are blind so often to your ways, to your truth, and to your presence. And so I pray, Lord, that through the gospel, you give us perception. You give us the ability to see so that, Lord, our lives, we would look at our lives and you in a different way. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. That's really where we begin today. How aware are you? How self-aware? How aware of what's going on around you in the world are you? It's a tough to say, isn't it? Because we don't, can't see what we can't see. Recently, I was reading a book by a guy named John Robison. He could never really see himself very well or see others. As he was growing up, people thought he was a little bit strange. In relationships, he seemed detached, awkward. You know, people, when you meet them, they're sort of like walking, social, awkward moments. Well, that was John. That was his life. Now, some people thought he was a nerd because he was mechanical. He liked to take things apart with his hands. He liked to work with electronics. And it wasn't until he became an adult that Asperger's was diagnosed. Here's what John looks like. Now, mind you, he's married, and he operates a business of his own. But something has always been missing. You see, John has this mild autism, and it keeps him from being able to read social cues when he's talking to people, and facial expressions don't mean anything to him. The fine details of interactions, he, he just can't pick them up. 
And so this hinders his ability to connect with people and to build relationships with people who are around him. Now the amazing thing was all of this changed when he entered into an experimental treatment called TMS. That stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. A non-invasive way that they can stimulate with magnetism parts of the brain in a way that maybe they haven't stimulated, been stimulated before. This is the, what the device looks like. So imagine this. One day, John is driving home from one of these treatments. He hadn't been able to see any, any effect thus far, and he turns on the radio. And he's like, wow! He starts to feel emotion. It's just flooding over him. Mind you, he's heard these songs many times before, but they've never registered to him in this way. And now he begins to hear everybody's voices and what they sound like and the emotion and even the sound of his own voice, he's never really heard the emotion in it. He says, the filter of autistic disability, if that is what hid the emotion from me before, seemed to have vanished. I heard a smile in one voice and I saw it on my friend's face and I felt its truth inside of me. He describes it as like coming alive for the first time. Or maybe a colorblind person now being able to see all of the colors of the spectrum. And as I began reading his book, I thought, that's the way I think all of us are. Not socially in interaction, but the way we are in the world in being able to perceive the presence of God and the work of God, and the spiritual life that we're really living, but we can so rarely perceive as we're going through our days. We can't perceive our spiritual condition. We can't see where God is at work in the world. And as we open up the book of Galatians, Paul talks about the time where he has this epiphany, sort of like John. He talks about the day when he's like, Wow, I couldn't see this before, and I never really knew that God was involved in my life in this way. You see, this is what's happening as we open up this part of the text. You see, something happened in Paul's life. The gospel, grace, came into his life, and now he sees his life, the days that he's lived, as he's never seen it before, with a new vision, a new awareness, and I think this is the effect of grace. It's the effect of this relationship with God. And by the way, the language of this new awareness fills the pages of Scripture and the poetry of God's people and the hymns and stories of the faith. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, we've heard the hymn, right? That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind but he says, but now I see, John Newton said. He said, now I have this new awareness. That's it. And this is the first step on our journey of this study that we've called Gospel in Life. Now, last week, Dave laid a solid foundation for us to be clear about the gospel. Simply the gospel is the news of God's love for us. Despite who we are or where we've been and what we have done? And you say, well, how is this possible? Well, it's not because we've gotten our own lives together or reformed ourselves. It's because, as Paul said in the verses above, Jesus came and rescued us. He died in, in an exchange, his life for our lives, giving us his place with God so that we could always count on God's kindness. Now our problem is, and this is a problem for me, is we believe this and we've heard it intellectually. We talk about this a lot at Granada. But the reality is then seeing it and translating into my life is extremely difficult. I can't see it. I don't know how it fits in. And that's the purpose of this study, to be able to see and learn the connection between the gospel and everything in my life. And that's the reality. The gospel connects with every aspect of our lives. One of my favorite Robin William, William movies is entitled Good Will Hunting. A little spoiler alert, if you haven't seen this movie, I would recommend it. But it reveals the depths of this man, Robin Williams, because he's not playing a comic. 
It's not a funny role at all. Instead, Williams plays a psychiatrist named Sean McGuire, whose wife has died of cancer. And he is working with a brilliant orphan named Will Hunting, played by Matt Damon. You'll see the two of them here. Will is a genius, by the way. But his past is so broken, he cannot move forward in life. And by the way, he has just read everything. And he's got a photographic memory. And he is a genius. And he knows he's a genius. He's filled with pride. And one day, in, the, in this scene, Sean, the psychiatrist, challenges Will to see that there's something that surpasses the kind of knowledge that he has. He confronts him. He says, look, if I asked you about women, you could probably give me a syllabus of your personal favorites, but you can't tell me what it's like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. If I asked you about love, I bet you'd quote me a sonnet, but you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable, known someone who could level you with her eyes, feeling like God put an angel on earth just for you, who could rescue you from the depths of hell. And you wouldn't know what it's like to be her angel, to have that love for her forever, through anything, through cancer. And you wouldn't know about sleeping, sitting up in a hospital room for two months, holding her hand, because the doctors could see in your eyes that the terms visiting hours don't apply to you. You don't know about real loss because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. You see, he's challenging him. He's saying, yeah, you know about this stuff in books and and you've read about it and you think you're really smart, but do you really know life? And that's the challenge that hits us when we open this book. It's as if Paul says, yeah, you know the concepts of grace. You've heard about Jesus dying for you maybe a hundred times, but is it really in your life? Is God the God not just written about in books, but the one who has walked through you through the deepest darkness in your life? And so you know he's real and grace is palpable because you've known his love when you've been at your worst. He said, that's what this is all about. That's what it means to be among the people of God. It's true, Christianity answers the great questions of life, but there's more. This is real, it's palpable, and it touches the depth of your being and your life. It is lived, and it is experienced, and this is the way the gospel works. And that's why it's about the way you treat people, and what you give your heart to, and what's worth living for. Not in a legalistic way that says, you better do this or else, but in a loving way that says, I want you to flourish. I want you to have life to the fullest. That's the gospel. And so we start looking at Paul's story because he wants us to know the gospel, not just in ideas. He wants you to be living it. He wants this to be your life story because it is. And that's where he begins. So today, if you're following in the outline, that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Lessons from a life of grace. Now, as I mentioned, at the beginning of this book, Paul could quickly go off and talk about ideas and theology, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he talks about his own story. Do you know that the gospel story is the story of every person's life? Yeah, not everybody knows it. Not everybody has been redeemed and and gone through that part of the story, but it's about estrangement and a hunger for connection. It's about needing love and community. It is about a way to make sense of the world. And Paul is saying, let me tell you, it's it's in your story. Let Let me tell you my story. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Christ. He said, look, I didn't make this up. If I was going to make up a story, guess who'd be the hero? It would be about me and my success. It would be about how well I do and how I've performed. But instead, the gospel points to God himself, to Jesus and what he's done for us. It's not something I've achieved. It's something I've received. He says, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, 
And I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He says, hey, look, if you want to talk about religion, he said, I went all the way with that. So don't believe this is about being religious. You know, I think when people are invited to church, they think they're being invited to be more religious. But the gospel is not that invitation at all. The, the gospel is an invitation to God himself. He said, look, I have practiced this stuff. He was so devoted to, to his Judaism that when the new group of Christians arose, he sought out to have them killed, to protect what he believed needed to be protected. He was a faithful Jew. And by the way, he loved the Jewish people and the Jewish law, but he knew that that didn't change his life. He knew the deep brokenness that was in him. He knew that all the things in Judaism couldn't repair those things deep inside of him. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. Now, he heard something that was from not, not in this world. Who was he going to go talk to about it? He rewinds the tapes, and this is what he sees. God started doing this before I was born. He said it was before my own story, as I typically think about it, even began. He says, when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb. This didn't begin the day when, when, when he, he understood the gospel. It didn't begin the day when his life started to change later on in his life. It began even then. God loved him when he was in his mother's womb, and God started this in his life. He says, I didn't do this. This doesn't come from me. And this is really the first message of grace that we need to get. God was at work loving you before you knew him, before you were even born. You may not see this. You might not have that vision to be able to see back to that place. But long before you knew who God was, long before you came to him, he was loving you from all eternity. This means that your life rests not on you every day, but on his steadfast love that has been there all along. Um, this past week, I don't know if you saw those last six seconds of the NCAA basketball finals. You know, March has bled into April, and it was really an amazing game. While we were watching it, I was remembering one of the greatest finals of all times, or actually one of the greatest tournaments, 1983. When a very unlikely team under the leadership of Jim Valvano from North Carolina State, the Wolf Pack, actually got into the tournament. Here's a picture of Jim with his team. Let me tell you what happened. It's really cool. He just, when he got into the tournament, because they were unlikely to even get into the tournament, he threw a big party at his house. And his dad came over to the party. And this is what Jim says. He says, my father calls me upstairs. Mind you, they haven't even gone to the tournament. And he's got his suitcase. What is that for, I said? I'm going to be there when you win the national championship. My bags are packed. Now, this was not going to happen. So he took his team to New Mexico. By the way, they had no chance of winning. But they managed to survive. It really looked like surviving. It didn't look like thriving. And to move to the next round, it was miraculous. And then they got to the finals that year, and they were playing against the University of Houston. And the University of Houston had won their last 26 games. I mean, these players were bigger. They were much more experienced. The team was much more powerful. This was impossible. And they managed to pull out a historic victory. And guess who was ready to get his picture taken with his dad at center court? This is an amazing picture with Jim is running down looking for somebody to hug. Don't you love that? He's looking for his dad. A few years later, his dad died of a heart attack. And he had the opportunity to speak at the service. And this is what Jim said. He said, he, my dad, believed in me when I failed. He believed in me when I wasn't as fine a son, friend, husband, father as I could be. He's the one person who when I didn't measure up to my standards or someone else's standards, he'd look me in the eye and he'd say, you're going to make it. I know you are. My bags are packed. You're going to make it. That's grace. You see, when we begin to realize this is the way God works with us, this is the way he speaks into our lives. They're like, I've always been for you. I've been at work in your life. I know, 
I know who you are. I know what you're made of. And I love you. This is what Paul says that God, our true father, began giving him from his birth. And you know this is true of your story? Your story has been filled with the presence of God, even if you haven't seen it. Paul says, I look at my story. And I see the hand of God from day one, every step of the journey. And look at what he says. He says, look at how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. So when he was at his worst, he's actually trying to destroy what God is doing through Christ. God was still working with him and in him when he's going the wrong direction. He's doing the wrong things. Jimmy V's dad was like that. Jimmy V got caught up in a scandal at at NC State. And his dad was still loving him. When you're not living up to your potential, when you don't care about God, when you're struggling, when you make foolish decisions. By the way, God doesn't want you to be in those places, but he doesn't withdraw his love from you. God loved you when you were at your worst. That's grace. And clearly, God doesn't wait until you're worthy, until we deserve it. God's love is not about deserving. And by the way, this is the opposite of what the Christians in Galatia were hearing. You see, they had some folks who had come to faith in Christ out of Judaism, which was really great preparation. But then they returned to the law saying, God basically treats you how you deserve. So if you want good things from God, you better give good things to him. And Paul says, look at my life. It's about me giving nothing to God. And yet God loving me. I was doing the worst things And God was pursuing me. This is the nature of God's love. February 1887, long time ago, February 1887, a manuscript, basically a pile of papers, was deposited at a magazine, the front door of a magazine publisher in London. They were all disheveled. And there was a little note on that pile. I must ask your pardon for the soiled manuscript, the note said. It is due to the strange places and circumstances under which it was written. Actually, that pile of disheveled papers was an amazing masterpiece of English poetry. And the story behind it is amazing. The young man who wrote it grew up hearing about the love of God. He went to college. He got a medical school entrance. But he was never happy. And soon he was living in the streets of London, destitute, Actually, you know what's interesting? The return address on that parcel of papers, if they'd been published, the money would have been sent to a chemist, a pharmacist. And the reason is because this young man would go pick up his opium at that pharmacy. You see, the backstory to this man's life is this. When he was 18 years old, his mother gave him for his birthday a copy of a book with the title Confessions of an Opium Eater. By the way, parents, don't give this stuff to your kids, okay? Give them really good stuff. The author told of a dreamlike state induced by opium that would stoke the fires of creativity. And this 18-year-old boy took the idea to heart. And soon he was hopelessly addicted, and his addiction led to a failed suicide attempt. And years of his life were lost. But God was pursuing him. Here are some of the lines of that 182-line poem left on the doorstep that day. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. The name of that man was Francis Thompson. And his poem is entitled, The Hound of Heaven. You see, God loves him so much, and we don't realize that. God is the the hound of heaven. He's been in pursuit of each one of us out of his steadfast love. The reality is he was dying. He was doing so bad, and he was taken in by a street prostitute who nursed him back to health. There's a picture of him. He was brought out of addiction in a monastery, but he continued to relapse his whole life, and God was pursuing him. And as I read that, I think, God was pursuing Paul, this horrible figure. I mean, if you'd met him in his anger and in his rage against what God was doing, you would have wanted to stay away from him. But God was loving him when he was acting out. 
And this is the way grace works in our lives. You see, when, when, God, when we think God's not interested in us, he, he's still there. He still cares for us. When we think we have something to offer him, we think it's about being good people. But God's love is nothing like that. It, it's there for us when we're hurting, when we're at our worst. Now you say to yourself, well, well in the pain, how could God be working through that? I've, I've been through a lot. You don't know what I've been through. Here are a few other lines of that poem. All that I took from thee I did but take, not for thy harms, not to hurt you, but just that thou might seek it in my arms. In other words, in all of the brokenness, even there, that was theirs, that we might have this longing after God. Even then God is pursuing you in your loss and in your pain. And, and this is the story of your life. It is then that we begin to interpret our lives in a different way. But when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any, any human being. You see, he can now see God at work in his life. That God pursued him even though he was a fanatic and changed his heart and then prepared him with a purpose. Isn't that beautiful how it says that? That he had a purpose for him. He didn't go and seek out the approval of the apostles of Christ. What happened in his life was of God alone. God was pursuing him. And God then spent years preparing him for his future. The truth is God has a purpose for your story. It's not just other people like Paul or pastors or leaders or famous people. He has a purpose in your story, your calling. God's work in your lives, our lives, follows the same trajectory. And the beauty of it is that God uses imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. So think of this. Here is Paul who went after to kill the first Christians, and now he's going to the people farthest away, the Gentiles, to share the good news. Who would have thought that could happen? That's amazing. He was chosen and prepared and sent by God. He says, I was personally unknown to the churches that are in, of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. Hey, you remember that man who was persecuting us? He is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Isn't that beautiful? People didn't know him, but they'd heard his story. And they said, only God can do this. Yeah, we heard about him. We are running from him. This has to be from God. And this is the way the life of grace works. It's this simple. God finds you when you're not looking for him. God loves you when you're not deserving. And God has a purpose in your life beyond your planning. It's beyond what you've planned for you. Because that's the way God works. So you want to see the gospel at work? Look at your life. Look at how faithful God has been loving you, where God found you. Look at how God has, has nurtured you and prepared you and worked through you. It's right there. Now, years ago when I first encountered this man, he's been such an encouragement to me through the years. Um, I don't remember when I first read about Nick Vucicic. I don't know if I can even pronounce his name, but um, when he was born... A hush filled the delivery room. His dad, catching the first sight of him, nearly passed out. And a nurse had to come and put her arm around him to lead him back to talk to his wife who had just given birth. When they brought Nick to his mother, his mother took one look at him and said, take him away. Well, you say, well, how could that be? You see, Nick was born with no arms and no legs. You heard that right. None of the prenatal exams or tests prepared Nick's parents for the shock of seeing him for the first time. Here's a picture of Nick from the cover of one of his books. Even today, his appearance surprises people. Can you imagine a lifetime of stares? People whispering, wondering, is this really a person or how could a person be like this? Or the strange questions from people who approach you, like, how, how do you do this? And how does that work? But let me tell you, Nick's story is incredibly beautiful. My parents are devout Christians. 
But after I was born with neither arms nor legs, they wondered what God had in mind creating me. At first they assumed there was no hope, no future for someone like me, that I would never live a normal or productive life. You see, they, this was a throwaway baby. This is a baby that we don't keep. So how could this child now, these years later, become such a force for good in our world? Well, here's why. God loved him. Even when a mother wouldn't take him in his arms. By the way, Nick, he's graduated from college. He's written a number of best-selling books. And now he's married. He has one son, and there's another child on the way. Here's a picture of Nick with his wife and son. And you know, when I want to throw a pity party, I remember Nick. And I begin to think about grace in a different way, and I hope you will. Today, though, my life is beyond anything we could have imagined. Every day I hear from strangers via telephone, text, email, and Twitter. They approach me in airports, hotels, and restaurants and hug me, telling me I have touched their lives in some way. I'm truly blessed. I am ridiculously happy. And if you hear him speak or you read his works, you'll know he's not exaggerating. But there's more. This isn't about Nick. He's, it's not all about him. His is an amazing story, by the way, but God is revealing his glory in the encouragement that flows from Nick's life. Here's Nick again. What my family and I could not foresee was that my disability, my burden, he puts in quotes, could also be a blessing. Offering a unique, unique opportunities for reaching out to others, empathizing with them, understanding their pain, and offering them comfort. Yes, I have extinct, distinct challenges. Neither my faith nor my sense of purpose grew strong until I went through some very scary times. He said, look, I've walked this journey. You can look at me and hear my story, but do you know where it took to get here? But he will tell you it's all of grace. God isn't after the easy story. It takes me a lifetime to figure that out. But he's been faithful in everything. In the end, God's name has been praised. And you see how God can work through the broken, how God uses the weak to shame the strong. It's a story of grace. And the reality is God has worked in your story to make it the place of his grace as well. And that's what this whole series is about, learning how God has done that. How he's done that in Christ. The question is, do you have the vision to see that? Do you have the ability? Because you see, it's through the gospel. Or are you blind to God's presence in your story? To God's purpose in your story? Can you see those times when God was pursuing you? Now, maybe you're in pain right now. And it's hard to see this. And even harder to believe it. And you know, I sometimes think about this, and I wonder, what would it have been like if I was there as Jesus was on the cross? I would have walked in front of the cross, and I would have said, this is the most meaningless thing that could happen. How could this be value, of value to anybody? This seems useless, and yet it was right there when the Son of God was on the cross that God was doing the most important thing that needed to happen in history. He was redeeming me at that place of brokenness, and that's the gospel. And when I come to see that, I then look at my life, and I look at the lives of others in a different way. You know, God loved you first. He never stopped loving you. And your story is one of beauty because Jesus laid down his beauty for you. And there is purpose. Maybe you don't know what it is yet, but I hope in this process you will discover it. You see, his call is an invitation to walk in and enjoy his love every day, to see your life with purpose as a work of that beauty in the gospel. So you come on the journey, bring all the fears, all the doubts, all the questions, all the pain, all those things we want to run from, and look at them with God's grace. Let's pray. Father, I need to hear stories because there are days when or days when I just want to complain. <laughs> or maybe I want to throw it in, throw in the towel. And you show me Paul. And when he, he was at his worst, you were loving him and redeeming him. Father, you show me people like Nick, who people would look at him and say, what good could come out of his life? Or Francis Thompson, who struggled with addiction. And yet his life is the story of your faithful and loving pursuit. Lord, I pray that as we're on this journey together, you give us the ability to see our stories 
that maybe we've never seen before as the tale, the message of your faithfulness and goodness. And that'll impact the way we go forward in our lives. That'll impact the way we live going forward from here. And Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, it's so much greater than, than the depth of our brokenness. It's so much more that can be extinguished by the doubts that I've struggled with. And so, Father, I praise you. I thank you. I thank you that you're glorified in all of this. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.